going to record um, our meeting. Uh, I just welcome everybody to our uh, our big game meeting. Um, before I jump into it too much, um, I want I do want to um, spotlight some of our commissioners. This is Commissioner John Hoggett. Um, okay. How do I turn it up a little bit? Just show me how you can do it. I got it up as much as it'll go. All right. I also have Scott Castles. Picture sucks. Well, Scott, you're on mute. And we have Pat, Pat Bergeron. Um, and then hard to find you all, you know, list this long. I thought Ken was on here. I'm missing I him. should still be on there somewhere. But Hurry, yeah. There he is. There, yeah, just have him talk. But here, it, Alicia, did you notice anybody else? But yeah, this is our, the, we've got at least four of our commissioners uh, joining us. Um, Oh. I didn't notice anybody else, but there is a really long list. So I'm sorry if we left out somebody. Um, somebody else that we, we should make a note of is our director, Tim McCoy, um, has also joined us tonight. So thank you, Tim. Um, with that, I will remove the spotlight and we will go ahead and get started. There's a number of staff um, that have that are here as well. Um, I really don't have time to sort through everybody. So, and anyway, um, let me get started with some of this. And share my screen. All right, that should be sharing my um, Looks good, Luke. Okay, sounds good. We'll go ahead and get started. Like I said, my name is Luke Maduna. I'm the Big Game Program Manager for the Game Parks Commission. Um, welcome to our uh, winter big game meeting. We've had eight of them um, so far spread out across the state. Um, this would be our ninth one. Um, we had 404 registrants um, as of a little bit ago. Um, and so it's good to see um, 136 people on right now. Um, go through some instructions on how, if you're not real familiar with Zoom, um, you can, uh, the mutants, the, the video controls are, are down in that corner. Um, the chat is a real handy place to, to place comments um, and, and uh, questions. Um, that works really well. As big as we're gonna be, it's gonna be really hard to, to open up the floor. Um, so the, the comment box is gonna be the, uh, um, the best place to do that. And we'll try to keep everybody muted just to uh, um, reduce the, the audio clutter. Um, yeah, the, the chat is gonna be over in that little box over in the corner when you turn it on. Um, and if you wanna change the view, sometimes it spotlights like when we're sharing, but if you wanna see the tiled view, you can change that view up there. Um, the basic meeting format here, we're gonna talk about big game, um, which is mostly you know deer, elk, pronghorn, turkeys, and bighorn sheep. We'll cover those first three. If you got questions on the others, we'll try to uh, address those as well. Um, I've got a fairly quick slideshow. I'm going to talk about our 2021 uh, deer uh, season overview. Um, just a, a real, you know, kind of quick snapshot across the state. Um, I'll go through a little bit of our um, 2020 deer hunter survey um, that we did last uh, May and June. Um, and more importantly, show you where to, you can find the results and explore that on your own. Um, and we'll have a little bit of discussion about elk. Um, I'm not going to wait too deep into the, actually, I don't think I've even got a slide on pronghorn. Um, but we can try to address any questions that pop up about that. Um, and once again, you know, this is for you to, this is your meeting to ask some questions and, and give us comments, give us feedback. Um, like I said, we got, there's a lot of our staff here. We've got half of our commissioners um, here to, to, to listen to you. Um, and so we'll try to make time um, for all that. We'll, we'll try to get through as many questions as we possibly can. Um, the, I, I got one basic rule here is just be respectful. Um, these meetings don't work if, you know, it, it gets out of control. So the chat is a, a great place to, to do a lot of that. 
Um, everything that gets typed into the chat will be included into our meeting notes. All of our meeting notes that um, come from all of these meetings end up going to our commissioners, administration, all of our staff, um, so that your thoughts do get shared with, with everybody. Um, it does help if you, if you start your comment with whether it's a question or just a comment. Um, it helps us know whether it's something you just want in the record or if it's uh, a question that you, you, you would like an answer to. Um, and, it, and sometimes it's hard to type that out if we don't understand something, um, we can probably, we, we, we can let you uh, um, unmute and, and chime in with, with something to um, clarify. Um, but like I said, with 136 or whatever right now, it's gonna be a little difficult to have a, a, a full open floor um, just to, to get everybody turn that annotation off. Hey, Luke, that, yeah. we already have one thing in the chat, just asking if it's going to be, uh, this recording is going to be available later for folks? Um, I'm going to try. Um, in, in the past, they haven't worked real well to convert. We're going to try to get it um, put on YouTube. So I'm, I'm hoping to, uh, hoping to do that. Yes. So I'll... let's see. So uh, let's see. I planned on doing an attendee survey. Where is my survey? Um, good to go. So we could get information from everybody. And oh wait, there it was. It is under poll. Um, so launching a poll here. So just go through, I'll give it a, a minute or so. Um, just, it helps us understand who's, who's all attending. If, if you're a hunter or a landowner, um, what part of the state you're from, um, go ahead and click through that. Shouldn't take, what is there? Four questions, um, helps us understand everything. So. I told, so go ahead and finish that up. Um, we're at 103, 415. So we'll uh, uh, go ahead and end that. And Hey Luke, it's Scott. Luke, I couldn't enter all the the data, so I don't know if anybody else had any problem answering, but it kind of froze up. Okay, I, I apologize. I don't know that I can change much. Of oh, that, yeah. unfortunately. Computer technology. Just... Yeah, <laughs> especially when we're working over the web, sometimes things glitch out. But yeah. especially when you get a couple hundred people answering a poll. Yeah, so. we got most most people. So. Um, all right, I appreciate that. We'll uh, we'll keep moving along. Um, so our overall big game management goal in the state is to manage big game populations at levels consistent with social and biological caring capacities and provide opportunities for the aesthetic enjoyment in hunting. Um, what that means is that we're you know we're going to listen to landowners, we're going to listen to hunters. Um, it, it overall it, we we take in a, a lot of input um, from people. You know, and that input comes in, you know, through meetings like this, through individual meetings, through comments that we get, um, you know, from, from landowners, hunters, and the general public regarding wildlife issues when they pop up. We also look at biology. We're looking at the age structure of, of the wildlife from, of our hunts, um, you know, also some, some surveys that we do, you know, looking at um, fawn and, and calf production. Um, we look at research results, you know, results, annual survival, those types of things. 
Um, we also look at, at you know disease and parasite issues that pop up, whether it's you know CWD and EHD are the the, the common ones that we uh, um, look at on an annual on an annual basis. But we're always you know looking at, at other ones that pop up as well. Um, so all those things are you know part of what what helps us. Um, I guess the the other thing that I that somehow left off that list is all of our harvest data, and that's what I'll present a lot of tonight is our harvest data. Um, so our overview of our November firearm season that we had, um, we had about 37,000 deer um, checked. That was down 12% um, from the 2020 and 14% from the five-year average. Um, last five years have, have um, averaged about two and a half um, percent fluctuation. It does go up and down a little bit, but this year was definitely down. Um, mule deer harvest, um, buck harvest was down 10%, doe harvest down 11%. Um, from the five year, it's down 28 and 20 percent there. Whitetail harvest, uh, buck harvest was down 12 percent. Doe was down 14 percent um, from the five year, um, down slightly less than that. Um, so yeah, overall our, our our harvest was down um, during the firearm season, um, and that trend. I just downloaded stuff. Most of our seasons, uh, every, every season other than um, river antlerless, um, closed on Sunday. Um, river antlers will go through the end of the month. Um, but looking at that data, um, our, our harvest in most of our units um, was down um, to, to varying degrees. Uh, just for reference, when I'm talking about our deer management units, um, you know, it's the 18 units that have our unit permits. Um, if I'm talking about the different portions of the state, I'm talking about our different administrative districts, Northwest, Southwest, Northeast, um, and the Southeast. Uh, is how we break up administratively. Um, just so if, if you catch me talking about that, that's what um, that's in reference to. For like the southwest part of the state, um, you can see, you know, by and large, our, our overall harvest was down. Um, and I guess I, sh I should say th this wasn't entirely unexpected for us. We've been pretty aggressive with our um, antlers permits the last few years. Um, so at some point when you're you know, shooting a lot of does, you're going to see a, a result in that. Um, we did also, as I'll get into, have, have some EHD um, across uh, a fair part of the state. So um, it's not a huge surprise. But overall, the Southwest um, was down 8% um, from last year and 18% from the five year average. Um, and each of those units um, was basically down to a varying degree. Republican was about the same um, as last year, but um, overall trending downward. Excuse me. Um, southeast part of the state, um, fairly similar, down 10% from last year. Uh, it should be 2020, not 19, and 7% from, from the year before or from the five year average. Um, Wahoo is down a little more. Wahoo spiked uh, last year um, a, a little higher uh, than it had been in previous years, but most of the others have, were, were fairly even. Uh, Blue Northwest was, was down a little bit. Um, looking at the Northwest part of the state, um, overall down 9% from the five year average, down 10%. Um, Sand Hills uh, was down from last year, but about the same. Um, you can see Sand Hills has been trending upwards. That's mostly whitetail harvest. We've been increasing whitetail harvest out there. So, um, but yeah, each of the others, uh, Pine Ridge has been, been fairly steady. Um, Plains and Upper Platte were both down. Um, so let's see, missed the Northeast. Um, similar story down a little more. Northeast was where we saw the most uh, EHD um, this past year, but yeah, those trends are, are fairly consistent. 20% um, down from, from 20 and 18% down from the, the five-year average. Uh, the Northeast part of the state's been fairly consistent over the last few years. Um, Loop East, had increased, but that we'd significantly increased doe harvest um, up there with all those, with the triple tags and all that. So, um, I skipped that somehow pretty early on. Um, but looking at our age data, um, we didn't have any age data from 2020 or we just had the, the inside spread on the antlers. Um, but we typically age about 20,000 deer um, annually at our check stations, which is comes out to be a 40 to 50% of our bucks. So we've got a good estimate on what our age structure is. 
Um, in 21, we, at, we aged uh, 3,300 mule deer bucks and about 15,000 whitetails. Um, and like I mentioned, that inside spread, um, that was came from some UNK research and um, actually Brian Peterson, I saw his name, he's actually on here. There, his office was the one that did that research that, that found that 11 inch inside spread was a good separator um, to use that separates uh, both uh, uh, or separates yearling bucks from uh, the age class two plus um, for amazingly both whitetails and mule deer. Um, that was done uh, going on about 10 years ago uh, when that research was done. So, um, but as you can see, our, our age structure has continued to improve. We've kind of plateaued um, and probably slightly regressed this year, but not by much, um, but it's been continuing to improve um, quite significantly um, since the early 2000s, where about 50% of our mule deer buck harvest and over 50% of our whitetail buck harvest was um, year, made up of yearling bucks. Now we're at 22% for whitetails and 10 to 12% on mule deer. Um, the special landowner deer uh, season uh, was something new this year that was established by statute. It was the Saturday to Monday preceding the firearm season. Um, it was a little clunky with the permitting process. Um, we hope to have that uh, streamlined with a new permit system. Um, that we'll be launching this next uh, November, December is the timeline that looks like that'll be popping up. Um, so we're, we're hoping that we can do some of that with the, the new, uh, um, for, for that season to, to help eliminate some of that. Um, overall, we sold uh, 3,690 permits, harvested 905 deer. Um, and you can see the, the buck and doe breakdown. Um, amazingly that those percentages um, are within a percentage or two of what the statewide archery and, and youth permits harvest on those permits. So um, not entirely unexpected there. Um, I see the chat just keeps going with lots of questions. Um, I appreciate that, awesome. I'll try to get through this so we can get to all those. Um, CWD, we sampled the five units in red this year, um, got about 1500 samples, had 112 positives um, out of that. Most of those positives were in the Platt, Buffalo and Republican, um, Wahoo, and, and the two blues uh, each had a few, um, but yeah, most of that was, was out west. Um, elk, we've sampled 157 um, of the 100 harvested so far. We've got results back from that many. Um, we've had a total of three positives, which that 2% in our elk has been real consistent as what we had um, the last few years. Um, and then, like I mentioned, our EHD, uh, we asked the public to, to report um, this last fall. Um, we took a fair number of reports um, from people, but it was uh, still a fraction of what we had um, reported in, in 2012. Um, most reports were, were whitetail deer. Um, out west, we did have a, a fair number of pronghorn um, reports. Some of those were actually from our, our research project that we had out there. Um, but we did have also have some mule deer and um, bighorn sheep mortalities as well from it. So. Um, that's part of uh, what played into our the, the way our season played out. Um, moving on to our uh, deer hunter survey, um, we sent a survey out to all the deer hunters that had a valid email address, which was about 70,000 deer hunters um, in late May and early June. We had about 10,000 responses, um, which isn't too bad. I, I, we'd like that to be more. Um, but we had questions on success, satisfaction, management units, uh, weapons, access, population status, permit use, all sorts of stuff that we're, we're looking for uh, your opinions on. Um, that full report can be found on our website under the, on the wildlife, it's a new wildlife surveys page um, that we've got. So if you go that, it's got all of our, um, a bunch of our data on there, turkey reports and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, touch on a couple things. Um, hunter satisfaction remained moderately high, um, 3.8 or so out of a five scale. Um, most hunters were, were very sad, were, were satis on the satisfied side of the scale. Um, the other thing that we did, uh, if, any, if many of you remember how the uh, um, survey went, we asked hunters, you know, preferences on whether or not they shoot bucks, and most hunters showed selection for bucks. Um, when presented with options, uh, the yearling bucks, 86% of uh, people passed the spike, 71% passed the 4x4 the four four yearling buck, and 42% passed the uh, two-year-old. Um, and then when we get to the older age classes, um, that upper one up here is a three-year-old with these four or five, and then this one's six. These two are actually the same deer. 
three years apart um, and amazingly had almost identical uh, yes, no rates um, on it. So that was some interesting findings within that survey, but yeah, go to that uh, website. You can look at that survey um, in full. It's tw there's 20 some pages of information there. Um, I don't wanna bore you with tonight. Um, and watch your email inbox for another survey, um, hopefully this uh, either late winter or early spring, um, hopefully March or April, um, we can get, get that rolling. Um, so yeah, it, please participate in that. That's, that means a lot to us, Help, it sure helps me out. Um, moving on to elk, um, historically we've had increasing populations. Um, it, well, this says since the eighties, they started trickling in you know, before that. Um, they're, they're a charismatic species for the state. Everybody, um, they catch a lot of people's attention. Um, just with the habitat we have, the nutrition, um, everything like that, Nebraska has, has been quickly known for producing big bulls. Um, and across the state, elk are mostly met with enthusiasm. Um, most people, you know, like seeing elk coming across the hill and, you know, the enthusiasm is, is there until they, they aren't welcome and elk can overstay their welcome kind of quick. Um, in places we, we've seen, you know, a lot of landowners are happy to see three and five and eight elk come over the hill. Um, when it gets to be 15 to 20, they kind of pause when it um, hits 50 um, or more, they, it uh, tends to be an issue. And that's kind of some of what, a lot of what we're dealing with um, these last few years is trying to bring those numbers back down um, and help some of the, and help a lot of those landowners, um, you know, alleviate the damage that elk can do. Um, and you can see some of this damage that they can do in a cornfield. Um, they can do a lot of damage in a hurry. And most of that damage, how do I turn that annotation off? That's Anyway. Um, you can see all the uh, tracks they've, or the, the damage they can do most of that, most of our depredation issues occur in that corn milk interface. There's some, you know, fence damage and st stackyard damage. Um, most of the stackyard damage has been alleviated with, with building and, for, and providing supplies for, for stackyards, fencing in those um, stored feed supplies. Um, it's worked quite well. Um, here's some more shots. Beans are, are, are not, um, uh, Beans are as susceptible to damage as corn is. Um, they do like corn because they can sure hide in corn. I, I wish I would have uh, saved one of the pictures of a, just basically a set of antlers sticking out of one of these fields um, that we had. Anyway, you can see how historically, you know, we gradually increased. We were quite conservative um, with our permits. Um, harvest kind of shows that same pattern over the years. Um, you know, a little bit of annual variation. Historically, our bulls, we've had 78% success on those antlers. We've had 49% success on our cow permits. Um, so for the 2021 season, um, we increased our cow permits by 75%, 53% um, on the bull side. You can see those, those increases. Um, our harvest as of a week ago, um, we were at uh, 100 or 224 cows. The previous high was 209, and, uh, which was last year. Um, so we were at a, yeah, it was 187 as of the same date. I ran those numbers again today and we were up to 200 and, or, yeah, 245 um, total cows. Um, early success has been 56%. Um, those early and late permits, uh, late success was about 27%. Uh, right now, a lot of those units are having trouble finding where, where the, the cows are at. Um, so uh, on the bull side, that should actually be 198. Um, bulls were harvested, so our bull success was still 86% um, with that increased, um, uh, those increases in permits. Um, we've seen a, a, a lot of landowner cooperation. Um, those landowners that are, that are dealing with damage have been doing a great job of allowing access and, and getting cow hunters in and, and helping solve those problems. Um, oops, what happened? So as far as 2022, uh, we're working on evaluating those um, with the close of the season. Um, you know, for the most part, I think uh, uh, across uh, all of our units, our populations are headed in the right direction, um, which is good news. What we're doing is, is working, whether it's working uh, as fast as, as everybody would um, like, I guess is probably up for some debate. Um, but I think for the most part, we're, uh, 
we're moving in the right direction. Um, like I mentioned, landowners have been done a great job cooperating and allowing access. Um, and we'll evaluate both uh, quality metrics and adjust those permits um, into the future. We, we know how um, important the full quality is to, to people. Um, so that's something we wanna continue uh, with our elk. Um, and with that, we'll start getting to our, our, our questions and, and comments. And I'm gonna um, stop sharing here so we can see a little bit more. All right. Um, I got Alicia and Lucas helping me. Where do we start back up at the top of the chat? So, um, I guess the first one uh, it's caused the dramatic decline in turkey populations. Um, and we've seen a decline in turkeys across the state. Um, Northeast isn't alone. Um, it's it's not any one thing. Um, it's kind of a probably a you know death by a thousand cuts um, type of deal. Um, habitat has changed eight dollar corn um, and everybody farming road ditch to road ditch um, doesn't help farming practices have just gotten cleaner um, there's less waste grain um, is part of it. Um, the other part of it is you, our uh, population booms that we saw in the late 2000s, you know, and up to 2010 um, also coincided with West Nile that took out a lot of those avian predators, particularly great horned owls. Um, things like that. Great horned owls have recovered, um, have come back. Um, that same time, you, turkeys were also on the trajectory of colonizing the entire state of Nebraska. And it's common for a lot of species when they colonize an area to overshoot their carrying capacity. Um, so it's likely those numbers we saw in the late 2000s weren't sustainable. Um, and so they've kind of, in, in a lot of the country, come back to um, uh, normal numbers. Our uh, we, we use the rural mail carriers. They do a survey for us where they count the, the turkeys that they see. Um, and and those, those counts have, have mirrored what we've seen um, across the state. Um, we've also seen, you know, like in the Pine Ridge, turkey numbers are still fairly strong um, up there compared to historic highs um, of, of the, you know, the mid 2000s. Um, so, it, but, you know, the Pine Ridge is going to be, you know, overall better turkey habitat than, than a lot of the agricultural part of the state. Um, so that all plays into it. It's possible we've had some undetected diseases. We've picked up some avian pox on some, some birds that, that we've been able to get samples on. Um, you know, it's like I said, it's a number of things that are playing into turkeys. Um, the Frenchman, um, I guess our, our, our biology is, you know, a lot of it that, that we're looking at is the, um, the I, I guess, look, looking at our, our survival rates that we've gotten from the coloring project that we had out there. Um, we're also looking at the, the Dauphin ratios, but we're also looking at harvest data um, and, and, and all that to, to make um, our, our management decisions and, and looking at what people want. Um, uh, for, for deer numbers, you know, both landowners and um, general public, which sometimes that conflicts. Um, but a few years ago with the, the number of deer that particularly mule deer that we had out there, um, we were very aggressive with our with our doe permits. And uh, we actually decreased those last year and um, we'll continue to look at our um, our harvest data and all that. And if, if we need to make um, necessary adjustments to, to um, get those numbers where we want them, we'll do so. Um, let's see, Andrew, I guess hopefully you got your sound issues figured out. What, what was the primary driver of the early landowner hunt? Do you have stats broken up as to how many deer were harvested in landowner hunt versus nine day gun season? Uh, the primary driver of the early landowner hunt was that was set in statute that was passed um, through the legislature. Um, and then we had to, we were, uh, had to pass regs to, um, to facilitate that season. Um, I think I've heard, I had the stats there. Landowner season killed 900 deer, um, nine day, the total nine day gun, um, all hunters killed about 37,000. Um, I don't have the landowner uh, harvest for those days easily accessible. Um, typically landowner harvest, for the limited landowner permit is somewhere between five and 7,000. Um, 
let's see. Let's see, Jim, I don't, I guess I don't necessarily have a comment on the Cedar County. Um, you know, I suspect EHD has probably played a, a little bit of a role in that. Lucas might be able to um, chime in, that's up in his country. Yeah, Jim, Cedar County is kind of in that transition zone. There's a lot of ag, ag land and not, uh, we've lost some uh, CRP and belts and stuff, but uh, definitely had some EHD in that area as well. Be best, just probably give us a call in Norfolk and we can discuss it in person. For the comment, Tom. Oh man, I'm sorry, guys. I I must not have hit enter. I meant to have out of the state on that um that poll. That's my bad. I thought I I thought I included that. So sorry about that. Um. You asked, you wanted to repeat the question so we can understand what you're answering. Oh, they said I'm a non resident. Or, <clears throat> yeah. So, the poll is tough as if you're non resident. I had somebody message me directly, said I'm a non resident attendee, had to choose as in state. So, yeah, that I goofed up on that. Sorry about that. Regarding the survey? Yeah. Yep. I thought I included an option there. So, um, what happened to the deer population in the Frenchman, uh, whitetail and mule deer? Um, some of that's been harvest. Um, it's quite possible some of it's, I mean, we've been, we've been harvesting whitetails in that unit quite aggressively. I mean, you can look at the permits. Most of those permits have got bonus tags um, in the Frenchman. So we've been aggressive um, there. Uh, we've also been aggressive the last three years on, um, on the mule deer side of it. And, and you know, we had, in the spring of 2019, we had three landowner meetings um, across Southwest Nebraska. Um, we had somewhere around 150 landowners attend. Um, and two of them, two of the meetings were very um, heavily uh, persuasive that we needed to reduce mule deer numbers um, in that country. And then the one that we held in Oxford was, was um, more oriented around whitetails, which is to be expected in that part. Um, but that was that was part of it. That led us to increasing our, our uh, harvest on, on mule deer um, with that Frenchman West. Um, we've seen those populations reduce, start to reduce um, across a number of the range. I know there's probably still some isolated pockets that, that haven't had the harvest um, that's been needed to, to get those populations um, turned around. But for the most part, a lot of that country has definitely seen reduced um, reduced uh, deer numbers, and so we'll we'll start bringing some of that those uh, permit numbers down. Um, we already have, but we'll probably continue to do so. Um, uh, Matt Kaufman uh, comment in Antelope County during the nine day gun this year, deer sightings were noticeably down, buck sightings significantly down. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, Mark Knob, what does the game park soon do about damage to landowners caused by elk? Um, well, they're going to eradicate the herd by Paxton and Hershey. Something needs to be done. Um, I guess, yeah, Mark, I know I'm pretty sure you've been working with a lot of our staff out there that we're not going to, we're, we're not eradicating a herd by Paxton and Hershey. We've been putting a lot of pressure on that herd. Um, and we met with landowners to ask if, if they wanted us to um, continue putting pressure on it. It, it's, I, there's a lot of rumors floating around out there. There's nothing mentioned about trying to eradicate that herd, but um, you know, those, those, those herds in, in a lot of that corn country, if, um, if, if they're not wanted there, we can continue putting pressure um, on them with, with our hunters. Um, but yeah, Mark, keep, keep working with our staff, trying to get hunters and put pressure on them. Um, up there. Um, Kelly, question, has there been any thought to having a Nebraska resident only season for deer, um, similar to what it's done for the landowner season? Um, I don't know that we've, 
actually, we had a, a meeting talking about some of our uh, options today. That was one of the things that came up, whether we do it for a, a weekend or something like that. It's, it's an option. It, it, I don't know. It's, it's definitely an idea um, and something for us to definitely consider. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that I've got a great answer for that because it's, there's a lot that would play into that. Um, but it's, it's, it's definitely something that to consider and, and something for us to think about. Um, realizing shit, uh, Bill has a question, I think. Realizing shed, whitetail shed their antlers earlier than mule deer, does that factor into only having two week January antler season? Um, we'd like to see January antler season extended to the end of January, especially where limited quota exists. Uh, there's a concern over harvesting whitetail bucks um, in the last two weeks, January mule deer only. We, the, we typically have done just those two weeks. Um, yeah, I guess it's, it plays into a couple factors. We've been getting the harvest we need um, across most of our areas in those two weeks. Um, we did extend the river antlerless um, to the end of the month um, in particular because there was um, the, the areas where we have uh, all the, it's, almost all of our whitetail depredation issues occur within that river antlerless zone. Um, and so that uh, it helped us deal with um, whatever additional harvest we might need um, within there. And so, um, yeah, it's something that we, we discuss every year. Part of it is we, the part of the reason we don't necessarily go longer um, is somewhat out of respect for our landowners. Our landowners are getting tired of um, seasons and, and our, our, our deer are also getting tired of being pursued. Um, by that point in the year and in particular for the, the landowners, I'm um, just dealing with, with hunters knocking on the door. We want to be respectful of, of the time that landowners put in, um, in, in answering questions and, um, doing all that. So we've, uh, um, I, I guess the, the, the two weeks time period in January has kind of been a sweet spot for that to, to, to work out. Um, Uh, Cal, why are we the only state to have statewide deer tags for both non-residents and residents? Um, why don't we switch to a draw system like Iowa and Kansas? It, well, Iowa and Kansas have a draw system because they have a limited quota of permits. Um, we haven't had a uh, limited quota um, in, in, in part because our, you know, our goal is to provide opportunity for people to hunt deer um, and not be overly restrictive. Um, but that's one of the things that, you know, could potentially be, be changed in the future um, if, if we wanted to go that direction. But w without a, we, we do have a draw for the, the Frenchman and the Platt um, in DCA permits because the demand is so high and they sell out, um, they would sell out so fast. Um, so those have gone to a drawing. We just haven't had a statewide drawing because we don't have, um, we don't have limits to, to those permits. Um, or, and I should say that we, we do have uh, limits to those unit permits, but there, there's very few that, that sell out um, very fast. Most of them um, don't sell out till, a lot of them don't sell out till October. Um, coming to the hundreds of, if not thousands of deer found in North Central unit, uh, that would mostly be EHD, John. Um, I guess if, you know, if there were thousands of deer found, we asked people to report them. Um, we didn't, I think it totaled like, you know, the, the reports that, that we got was between three and 500 deer total. Um, we had 6,000 reported in 2012. Um, so it, it, if there were thousands, we, we need people to report them um, if they're seeing them and calling them into our offices um, so that, that we can make informed decisions on on that. Um, Cal, why are non-resident tags cheaper than either Kansas or Iowa and available over the counter with an unlimited dozen two bucks for any non-residents? Um, no data on, I think, I'm trying to remember, I'll include it this next year if I haven't been. I thought I was including the number of non-resident permits sold in our in a deer um, harvest report that I've put out the last couple of years. Um, but to your previous question, why are non-resident tags cheaper? 
Um, for one, right now we're we're basically at our max statutorily, um, and every state does it differently. You know, Kansas and Iowa are the most expensive uh, states to to whitetail deer hunt. Um, we're basically exactly the same as what South Dakota, um, Oklahoma, and uh, North Dakota are. You know, to compare our, our Great Plains, um, but we're also like a hundred dollars more expensive than um, uh, <laughs> Minnesota and Wisconsin, man. And we're, we're a little more expensive than Missouri. Um, so we're, we're, when it comes to on the whitetail side, uh, we're kind of at the upper, we're kind of the upper end of the middle. Um, when you start looking across the whitetails across the East, uh, we're definitely at the lower end um, on the, the mule deer side comparing to Western states. Um, we're not, you know, a whole lot lower than, you know, than say what, uh, Wyoming has been. Um, some of those other states have gone up significantly here recently, but right now statutorily, um, our max is $285 that that non-resident permit can be. Um, it was 280. We moved it up to 282 this past year. We would have gone to 285, except that there's also a statute that limits, um, how much we can increase it. Um, each year, we can only increase 6% per year or 18% if it hasn't been increased in three years. Um, so we would, we would actually need the, the legislature to increase our authority on that, to, to increase that, that permit any more um, than where it is right now. Um, and our non-resident permits have been increasing um, in the number sold um, over the past few years. We had about 20,000 this year, I believe. Um, it was about 22,000 last year. Um, and it's slowly been trickling up um, from about 14,000 since about 2012, 2015, um, somewhere in there. It's, 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 it's slowly been, been trickling up, but historically, um, I mean, it, it stayed in that 10 to 15,000 for a, a fair number of years. Um, let me see, Brian. How, how many out-of-state guys shoot two bucks? I think that was a pretty low number. Yeah, it's been it's been about two and a half percent um, of non-residents shoot two box, and it's uh, so that that statistic um, about twenty percent of residents buy two buck permits, and about ten percent of non-residents buy two buck permits, um, and about two and a half percent of both residents and non-residents um, shoot two bucks. So it's a pretty low percentage that, that actually take advantage of that, whether you're residents or non-residents. Um, let's see, Brian had a comment about their hunt here. Sounds like Mark had a bunch of antelope on a wheat field today. Um, Carl, let's see. Yeah, and, and yeah, Carl, we've definitely been um, aggressive with, with our doe permits these last few years. And that's, that's part of what's going on. We also had PhD. Um, so yeah, and that river antlers tag, the permit, the purpose of that is to help us address those, you know, our, our those river areas are where we've got the, the biggest whitetail issues. And so having that permit that's valid on private land um, helps us solve a lot of those problems. What's our, I'm not sure how to address that all Tate. I mean, our mission statement is, you know, for, for dealing with social tolerance, you know, there, there's only so many deer that can be supported across the landscape. Um, but we want to maintain a, a good huntable number for, for our hunters. We want to provide a decent um, hunting opportunity. Um, it's definitely not selling as many tags as possible. The money, it, we get accused of, of being money hungry all the time. And then in the same breath, we get accused of having a cheap permit that, that doesn't go, you know, cheap non-resident permit. I don't like, I, I don't mean to be argumentative there, but that, that's simply not true. Money doesn't account for anything that I'm trying to do. 
Um, here, I, you know, I've addressed the age structure. The age structure has gotten better since, you know, over the last 15 years. Um, we do want to provide, we, we do take buck age quality um, or buck quality um, and age structure um, into account. You know, if our age structure starts to decline, we'll decrease permits. Um, some of that's hard to do with uh, all the unlimited um, statewide archery and youth and landowner permits, you know, somewhere around 50% of our buck harvest in any unit um, comes from an unlimited um, permit. So to, you know, there, there's give and take in, in all that if we wanna um, change some of that. Um, yeah, Joseph, some of the, the, the difficult part of that is in, in our age structure, um, a lot of deer that are, there's even a fair number, a fair percentage of our two-year-olds, we aren't able to cut the teeth or cut the cheek open to age. Um, and so we're, we age um, predominantly, you know, the yearling class is easy to separate. Um, the twos and three-year-olds, um, you can do a, a pretty decent job. Um, anything above that starts getting and can, can be fairly tricky. Um, yeah, I wish we could have, you know, have everybody send in incisors on every every deer that we had, but the, um, the, the price tag to get that done would be rather expensive. Um, most states, um, we, we get as good of age structure data um, or better than almost every state um, out there because we operate our in-person check stations like we do. Um, Kansas and Iowa don't collect any age of harvest data, um, that, at least that I've ever seen. They don't report anything for the, the deer report. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, I agree. I wish we could get better data, but it just, it becomes difficult with the, the number of deer that, that are, aren't able to be cut because of they're getting mounted. Um, there's a fair number of deer that even the two-year-olds that, that don't get the cheek, the cheek cut. Um, so it, it's hard to know. We do age a fair number, um, up into that four or five, six and seven age classes. Um, but most deer that are that size, they're going to a taxidermist. Um, and so we aren't um, able to look at those teeth. Um, Cal, why is there such a low amount of elk tags and unlimited supply of deer tags? It simply comes down to the number um, of deer and elk in the state. Um, there, there's just not as, I, there's not enough elk to, to support unlimited permits. Um, you know, we've got somewhere between two and 3,000 elk in the state and somewhere probably between two and 300,000 deer. Um, and so it's just a whole different scale. Um, and, you know, deer are more productive, um, you know, and, and so that you, you can harvest more does um, in that regard. Um, so it's just simply a, 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 a scale of numbers uh, when it comes down to that. Um, Brian, we have noticed a significant decline in turkey population over the past 10 years. Yeah, some areas it's declined significantly. Um, some of that's habitat. We've had a lot of country and some of, like I mentioned before, some of it they colonized. I mean, 10 years ago, man, if there was a mature tree anywhere, a good chance there was a turkey around it. Um, there's a lot of country that just simply wasn't turkey habitat um, or couldn't su support turkeys long-term. Um, and those areas that, you know, had, had turkeys for a short period um, and then disappeared, prob there's probably some habitat issues going on there. Um, but yeah, let's see, we'll go back and forth. Uh, Chad had a comment question. Um, Butler County deer numbers were down 50% uh, maybe more. Um, let's see. Are there are other trophy states on the sustained three weekends during the rut with rifles. Um, if so, who are they? Well, I guess I'm not sure that there's necessarily any of the trophy states. I mean, I'm sure I know that that's directed towards Iowa and Kansas. Um, a, a lot of the trophy idea is, is A comes down is in part because of habitat. Um, Iowa has twice as much whitetail habitat as, as we do in Nebraska. Kansas has half again more. Um, and then some of it comes down to culture. You know, I mean, Nebraska is 97% privately owned. Um, if, if our landowners and people wanted to support trophy deer in the state and the places that do want to support trophy deer have trophy deer. Um, 
within the state, you know, a lot of that, you know, what we see on, on TV in Kansas um, isn't reflective of the entire state. Um, they still kill a lot of yearlings and two-year-olds. A friend of mine um, hunts Northeast Iowa, um, which is really pretty good deer habitat, um, sent me a picture of their barn wall and there's a lot of yearling box on that barn wall. Um, you know, and, and when you look at the overall trophy, you know, when you say Boone and Crockett um, harvest, when you look at it on a per deer, um, har per buck harvested rate, um, we produce Boone and Crockett deer at about half the rate that Iowa and Kansas do. So we're not um, that far behind uh, what, what they're producing. I mean, we're, we're about seventh out of the 36 whitetail producing states. Um, we're right behind Wisconsin you know, in that rate who is largely considered the, the where the, they, they, they produce more Boone and Crockett's every year than any other state. They also kill like six times as many whitetail bucks as we do um, in a year. Um, and, and for that comparison, Iowa kills twice as many um, whitetail deer as we do. Um, Kansas about half again more. Um, so they just simply have more deer. You, to, to produce a lot of trophy bucks, you got to produce a lot of deer um, to start with. Um, and you know, being an agricultural state, it's, it's without that trophy culture, um, that's going to be hard. Um, but there's, you know, there, there's a fair number of states that, that have gotten firearm season. Most states actually have firearm seasons um, during the rut. Um, so, yeah, the, the, there's more to it than, than timing of the season um, to produce some trophy deer. Um, how are we aging the box? We're looking at tooth age, our two tooth wear and replacement. Um, so it's, it's looking at the, uh, um, the, the replacement they, they, of their molars and premolars um, and then the wear on those teeth. Um, so it's not just looking at the, the, just the dead animal um, or the outside of the animal. We're actually looking at the, the the tooth wear and replacement, that's a commonly accepted method of, of aging. And really, um, like I mentioned up above, we're, we're really interested in the yearling two and three plus categories. Um, beyond that, it gets rather difficult and tricky, but those three we can separate with uh, pretty good confidence. Um, so the, the harvested bulls, um, the, the, I, our data would disagree with with a lot of that, we've we've continued to produce some some pretty good bulls. The this we we've had um, a number of 400 bull, inch bulls produced uh, each of the last few years. Um, our age struck our age data on the elk, we actually take the incisors and those get sent to Matson, so they're uh, done through that cement manuli um, methodology, um, so they know how 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 old those are. Um, last year was actually, I believe, if I remember right, last year was the oldest our uh, bull age structure had ever been. Um, and so our, our bull age has done, has done pretty good over the years. Um, yeah, how many out-of-state tags are sold? I think this year was about 20,000. Um, So Cal, is there any possibility that there will be limits placed on doe permits or complete removal of them for public land areas? Um, why are there still statewide tags, not unit specific, only like um, Iowa and Kansas? Um, we, we have done some of that. We changed some of our permits in the Southwest, those Southwest reservoirs. We had a season choice permit um, and made it so the bonus tags and the Frenchman season choice permits weren't valid on those four Southwest reservoirs. Um, we've done something similar for the Harlan County Reservoir. Um, we've made a few changes um, or limited bonus tags and, and season choice or antlerless permits on um, places like uh, Bessie, McKelvey, and Valentine. Um, so we have done some of those things um, in some of those places. Um, I, I guess we still use a lot of those statewide tags because a lot of hunters really like those. Um, a lot of hunters have opportunity to hunt in, in multiple units and those permits appeal to them. Um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely something to consider. Um, interested in the status and any results of the GPS tracking studies uh, for understanding migration corridors. Um, any possibility of using federal wildlife corridor ponds for pronghorn, mule deer, or elk? Um, there's definitely possibilities. I'm actually uh, 
on that committee, um, the migration corridor uh, working group. Um, unfortunately, the uh, was that an, I'm trying to remember if that's an executive order or something that went through Congress um, that established all of that and those funds. Uh, we aren't one of the eleven states um, that are listed in that, um, so we the we can, we, there's, there is some funding available. Um, it's just gonna be a little trickier to, to fight or elbow our way for, um, since we aren't one of those, those states that's specifically mentioned. Um, but yeah, we do participate in that. Um, we've actually got a couple, um, I mean, we had a, a mule deer project, um, that's working through the University of Nebraska. Those results should be available here, hopefully in the next year or so. Um, there's a pronghorn project going on right now, um, that there's a, the, I, mean, I don't know if, is, if Andy is on here today. Andy Little is one of the um, one of our researchers over there. He's got a pretty good Facebook page. Um, I don't see him. It's too bad. But the uh, oh, what is it? It's uh, awesome. Is the the um, acronym for it? That's the Animal Movement or Animal. I can't even remember what it all is. Uh, but they've got a pretty good Facebook page where they share some of those movements um, on that pronghorn um, project. We've seen pretty good movement in and out of the Sandhills um, with that. Some of our antelope moving um, upwards of 75 miles. We had some that wintered north of Alliance that summered um, over north of Mullen. Um, so we're finding some of that stuff. And, and we'll keep trying to produce um, information on that. Um, and we are within a few weeks of launching an elk project where we're going to try and call our elk. Um, out in western Nebraska, a seven-year project um, putting GPS collars on on elk. Um, so we'll have some info coming out about that. Um, man, 63 new messages. I'm not going to keep up with you all. Um, Let's see, question from Blaine is, I'm concerned about the cancellation of spring bear season in Washington state, which is done simply by the governor not appointing a ninth commissioner on the state's wildlife board to break a tie. Um, Wanna make sure we don't see a reduction in hunting opportunities here in Nebraska. What safeguards are in place to prohibit, prohibit this from hunting to the big game seasons we have in Nebraska? Um, I, I don't know that I'm necessarily the best one to answer that. I think part of it is that we've got a, I mean, we have a, um, a constitutional amendment that that uh, makes hunting a, 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 what's the right word for it, a, a constitutional guarantee. Um, I, I think some of it is, I mean, Nebraska is a, a much more conservative state, um, far more conservative than what Washington is. Um, and I, I don't see that, uh, that necessarily happening. Um, but that, that constitutional amendment um, would play a big part in that. Um, uh, was Iowa able to make 10 million a year off deer resident tags? I would assume that's probably all. I, I doubt that's just their residents. Um, I don't know that they sell quite enough to make that much, but it, it really comes down to simply just, I mean, they, they issue... I guess well, they issue somewhere around like 300,000 deer permits um, a year. Um, we issue 130,000. Uh, they simply have more deer um, is, is what comes down to it. They have more deer habitat. Uh, a lot of their landowners have a higher support for, for deer numbers. Um, it's just, we're, you know, each state is given um, the resources that they have and not all states. Um, no two states are alike um, in, the, in the resources that they have. Um, I mean, for, for one, you know, one big difference, you know, looking at that, Iowa doesn't have any mule deer, elk, um, antelope, um, or bighorn sheep. Um, Kansas has a few of those, few antelope, um, and a few elk, um, and fewer mule deer than we do. They have no bighorn sheep. Um, you know, and so it's just, it, we just have, have different resources. Um, our total deer, I'm trying to think what we make on our deer permits, but it's, it's, it's more than two and a half million um, statewide. It's, it's closer to five, I think. Um, Calvin, have you considered reducing the required acreage for non-resident landowners with land in the elk area from 1,280 acres? Uh, I guess 
Short answer is not really. Um, the demand for those permits is so high among our residents. I don't think that we want to increase the pool um, of people that would be eligible for those permits. Um, right now, I mean, historically, those it used to be landowners get those permits every three years. Now we're we got some units that are taking seven and eight preference points. So you're looking at um, a 10 year wait between permits. Um, and that's the, our, our landowners aren't real happy with with that kind of waiting time. And we don't really want to do anything that's going to increase um, the number of applicants in those pools and, and nor would our landowners out there want us to decrease that that would um, also increase, you know, potential property values and things like that um, with landowner desire to get into those drawings. Um, so yeah, I would say that that's not something we're, we're looking at necessarily changing, um, at least from the, the commission side. Uh, question, why did the Pine Ridge November Farm sell it so fast? Uh, should it be a draw unit? Um, that's actually something that we're looking at um, is making a draw unit. It won't happen um, for this year, um, uh, but it, it will for 20, it should for 23 is probably the, the likely timeline that we're, we're looking at. Um, and that's just the, the demand for that permit has gone up. Um, over the years, it's just sold out faster and faster. So that's one of the things we're trying to address. Um, and we'll have, um, hopefully, to have some things to, to remedy that um, for this next year. It won't be a drawing, but there should be some things uh, in place to um, make it so it doesn't sell out. Um, and it, it did sell out uh, fairly heavily non-resident. Um, so it's, we're, we're, it's one of the things we're definitely trying to fix. Um, please explain how the special landowner permit season became part of the deer hunting regulations. Um, I kind of explained that earlier. Uh, that was that came out through the, the legislature um, that set that season in statute. And then um, uh, and most of the, the regulations that we put in place um, were spelled out in that, in that statute. Um, Let's see, a little bit of back and forth there. Lyle, you said you had a question on youth to youth lifetime permits. Do we still have Lyle with us? Are you gonna chime in or maybe ask that a little below? Um, a little bit of back and forth with some stuff. Let's see. Um, Question, has there been any discussion about an early muzzleloader season? I'd like to see one in October uh, during warmer weather. Um, not really. I mean, we get a few questions every year, but by and large, our muzzleloaders have been pretty happy um, having that full month of de December. Um, it tends to be a quieter time of the year. Um, the thing with moving seasons around, um, if, if those seasons get used, it's going to have other impacts. It may lead to reduction in opportunity um, elsewhere. Um, so I, yeah, we, we haven't, it's definitely something to, to consider, but with every change, there's always unintended consequences. Um, and so changing some of that season structure, um, I, I would say we're reluctant is the wrong word, but we're, we're we tend to like the, the status quo and, and not make major changes. Um, very quickly. So it's not something we would do um, without a lot of, of, of consideration. It looks um, like it was unmuted. If you want to, Lyle, if you want to speak up, go oh, ahead. Sure. Go ahead. Lyle. Okay. I'm here. Uh, my question is uh, we try and get the youth to hunt. We get lifetime permits for the youth. And when they get older out of college and get a job and they have to move out of state, if they've, they've spent the money, the parents have spent the money for the youth to have a lifetime hunting license. When they come back to, to Nebraska to hunt big game, they have to buy a, a license as a non-resident. And that kind of def defaces the value of that lifetime hunting license. That youth should be able to come back to his family for a holiday for deer season or turkey season and buy a tag at the rate of the regular as a resident because they've had to move because of their jobs or whatever. I think it's really unfair that all they can hunt is 
pheasant and quail, which we have very little in Northeast Nebraska. We lost a lot of pheasant and quail a couple of years ago and uh, rabbit and squirrels. And, you know, the youth is wanting to go out with their relatives to hunt deer and turkey. And I think it's ridiculous that they have to buy a turkey tag for $95 when they have a lifetime hunting permit. And I think that would be a nice gesture to try and get our youth. Uh, the NWTF has said that the, the average turkey hunter is 45 years old. We need to get our youth out hunting or as uh, older adults. That's, it kind of defaces the value of that lifetime hunting permits. So I just thought that that would be something that should be looked at to be fair to the ones that spend the money for a lifetime permit for the kids that have grown up and now they have a bring their kids back to Nebraska to buy their kid a ticket, which I uh, permit, I know it's cheaper, but dad with them would be nice that he could buy a tag for the same amount. So that was my only comment. Yeah, no, thanks for that comment, Lyle. There's, there's definitely, there's some states that do that. Um, I, I, th I think the reason that it, it that hasn't applied here is that that you know that's a um, a small game permit, but um, so yeah, no, I, I appreciate the comment. Well, we'll, we'll definitely uh, get that written down in the notes. Thank so thanks, you. thanks for that. Um, see oh where was i uh, i think you were at ryan Lee's oh yeah quality i think the quality of elk hunting in north platte uh unit has slowly declined over the past five years um land or consensus in the areas because more bull permits are being given out um yeah i i don't doubt that the the hunt quality in the north platte river um unit has has taken a bit of a hit we've been trying to decrease those those elk numbers um and uh i suspect mark is is probably fairly mark canob is probably fairly happy with or would be happier with fewer elk so that's that's part of the trade-off um with with trying to um deal with some of these you know we, we simply can't support some of the the elk numbers that we've had so we, we've got to get those elk numbers back in line um and the, the bull number the bull issue i mean that's the tricky part of that is, is, is bulls cause probably proportionately more damage than, than what cows do. So trying to balance that, keeping that bull quality, again, to have a lot of trophy bulls, you got to have a lot of bulls on the landscape to start with. Um, so there's, there, there's trade-offs there. There's issues that are going to pop up, but that's something we'll keep working through um, and trying to solve some of those issues. Uh, question, can you move rifle season so it's not during a rut? We asked our, let's see, let me get something pulled up. Or do I even have any more? So here, let me share my screen. This is a common question that we get. Um, so during the, for the 2019 deer hunter survey that we did two years ago, I actually asked this question, um, asked people when they'd like to see the season and overall, um, 70, 71% of our hunters wanted the season to stay the same, uh, stay where it was. Uh, when you look at down, break it down by a hunter group, um, even our archers didn't want it to change. That was still a 55%. I actually thought I was a little surprised that that was uh, as, as high as it was. Um, so when you break it down, then we gave those that wanted it moved when they wanted it to be moved. Um, an option, and it comes down to 43% uh, want wanted the season to be moved earlier in the year, and 57% wanted it to be later. So when you break that down, 71% of our hunters wanted the season to stay where it was, 12% wanted it earlier, and 17% wanted it later. Um, I wouldn't change the season because 17% um, of our hunters want the season moved. I mean, the, 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 the season dates, um, you really, like, like I've discussed before, that they, they really aren't going to play a huge role um, in, in the, the buck quality. Um, it, it ultimately comes down to how many bucks are you shooting. Um, you know, when it's when in that regard, um, the, the timing of the season is going to have not a whole lot of impact on that. 
Oh no, my chat scrolled all the way to the bottom. Mine did too, so I'm trying to find where you were. <laughs> I got a feeling, guys, we may not make it all th all the way through all this, but I'm going to try. Okay, I'm close. There. Uh, there's a comment had a comment about the season. Let's see, Robert. Will Game Parks taking a more aggressive approach to? I, I assume he meant CWD, such as Alabama. Um, do partnering stakeholders. Um, I would say yes and no. We actually um, just finished up a CWD survey um, of our hunters um, asking different uh, varying opinions um, on, uh, or I guess opinions on varying questions. Um, and we'll have some results of that. I, that just came back to us. I don't have the results of that here um, for you tonight. Um, unfortunately, but we'll have some information on that. And um, at some point, you know, that's something that we we do probably need to look into is, um, you know, having a CWD plan and, and, and all of those types of things. And so Luke, um, I mean, yeah. just, to, just to add in, we are working on a chronic wasting disease plan and that survey was part of the kind of the beginning of the planning process. And so, First of all, just trying to get hunter input and then try to work on some focus groups from there to try to decide, you know, are there some management actions that we can take um, to meet some goals for chronic waste and disease? So we are looking into it um, and we are working on a plan. Yeah. Thanks, Alicia. And it will, well, it will involve um, public stakeholder input too, I should say. Um, Bill, uh, why won't you issue non-resident elk licenses um, on the Sand Hills with significant elk damage? Um, we've definitely been working with a lot of those landowners um, trying to reduce that damage. A, a, a lot of it, the, the reason that we haven't gone to non-residents is just simply the, the demand among our residents is so high for those permits. Um, and I think if I look down, I think some people and non-residents can get an elk permit, but they have to be landowners. So yeah. that's the only one. So that's that's all part of it. Um, you know, I mean, it, when it comes down to it, the, the, the wildlife of every state belong to the people of that state. Um, and so most states tend to be very resident centric um, in that regard. Um, and so that's, that's one of the things, one of the decisions that's um, been made by, um, those before us that, that those elk permits are, are resident only um, in the general drawing. Um, Blaine has a, let's see. Like I can take it. this one, Luke, if you want me to. What's that? I could take this one okay, if you want. Sure. Because they're asking about more open fields and waters and expanding hunting oh. opportunities, especially sure. in the east of the state. I don't think, uh, I don't think TJ is on right now, but we are actually, um, discussing an access plan as well, including trying to expand access in places like the eastern part of the state. Our biggest challenge when we work in the eastern part of the state is, um, first of all, a lot of landowners aren't interested in open fields and waters. Uh, they're afraid of having their properties overrun. So kind of the next thing that we're considering is there's some kind of a, an access program that we can put into place that sort of um, you know, allows a certain number of access uh, participants on a certain site. So we're having some of those discussions internally, what that kind of a program would look like. Um, our agency, the Nebraska County plans to expand budget for this program. We're always looking for more money for this program. <laughs> um, lately, we've been able to get some federal grant dollars through the voluntary um, BPA, BPA HIP, voluntary public access. Um, program with the USDA and we're, we're always looking for some more money for that. And um, we can certainly ask the Unicam for some more dollars too, if we needed to go that route. And that's kind of in our, as we look into the horizon of the next biennium budget, that, that might be something we consider asking for more. And we appreciate the support of that open fields and waters program. It is 
very popular across the state and we are trying to find ways to expand that. Thank you. Alicia, um, next one down. Uh, John asked about bobcats and outlines for the turkey population decline. Um, I'm not going to blame them um, in that regard. It's just uh, it's quite possible that that bobcats and mountain lions and, and all predators, raccoons have played a, a role in that. Um, but largely, when, if you have a predator issue, um, that comes back to a habitat issue. When you've got good habitat, you don't have predator um, issues. Um, so some of that really comes back to to habitat. I mean, it's, it's likely, and some of it too, I mean, it probably took a while for a lot of those predators to realize that, um, that turkeys were a prey item. And, we, you know, so, it, so some of that is uh, just a, a change in that uh, habitat carrying capacity. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, that, that's another one of the, you know, death by a thousand cuts predation is, is a part of that. Um, oh, Lyle, there you actually got your question there. So, all right. Um, and Cal asked about three turkey tags. Uh, well, the, the turkey tags in the spring are basically tom or bearded hens. We shoot very few hens in the spring, um, but that's something we're 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 looking at um, bringing that number down just simply for the opportunity. Um, something will probably it won't be for for this year, but but potentially the next year, um, in, in in cutting those that tag. Uh, number back. Um, years back, there was a four point or better restricted buck permit for the Sandhills area. Why is this discontinued and could this be entertained for some units in Nebraska? Um, I would say that's probably been a, quite a while ago. Um, and most, most states, um, particularly um, looking at mule deer, have gone away from um, point restrictions. Um, in, in part, because um, let's see. I have something. I guess I don't have anything in dealing with with mule deer, but for for white tails, um, the the point restrictions they only per, uh, protect a small portion of the box. Um, I've got a screen here. Um, for for the most part, they're not necessary. Um, point restrictions really are only wh where they're successful. Um, really only protect some of our yearling bucks. On, on the mule deer side, um, it's about 10% of our harvest is yearling bucks. On the whitetail side, you know, we're at 22%. Um, that UNK research that they did, you know, a third of our yearling bucks have four points or more. Um, a third of them have three points. Um, so the, a three point rule, you know, in effect would only protect a third of your yearlings um, and would come down to about 7% of our total harvest. Um, so it's not, it's not really necessary. Our hunters are doing that themselves. They're choosing not to shoot yearling bucks. Um, and so it would, you know, ultimately become a, an unnecessary rule for hunters to accidentally break. Um, that's what a, a lot of the West, you know, started with that, you know, a lot of them were had two point rules on mule deer. Um, they'd get people that would accidentally shoot, um, you know, a buck that didn't qualify and that deer ends up getting left in the field. So you, you, you make violators of, of some of these guys. And that's one of the things that they found is, you know, that they refer to that as high grading where somebody shoots a deer that they shouldn't, they just leave it and then go shoot another one. So um, you in fact ended up killing two bucks when you would have only had to shoot one um, to start with. And so they, they weren't having the, the success. And generally um, where they have antler point restrictions in states like, you know, Pennsylvania, um, it doesn't produce more mature bucks. It just produces more two-year-old bucks. Um, and we're at a place right now where it's producing more two-year-old bucks isn't the issue that, you know, hunters, when you're thinking trophy deer, um, it, they're not wanting more two-year-olds. They're, they're wanting more four and five-year-old deer. So that's why we've never gone down the road um, of, of doing antler point restrictions or doing them again. Um, Yeah, kind of Keaton had a question about the moving rifle season out of the rut. Um, let's see, Dan, help me understand why a non-resident landowner permit is seven times more than residents. Um, as a non-resident landowner with farms, I permit a tremendous amount of property taxes to, as compared to neighboring states. Um, why such a penalty to the non-resident landowner? Also, why not offer a non-resident landowner use permit at a reduced price? Um, we do have the non-resident youth permits that, that are 
um, eight dollars. I guess the the other option is that special landowner. Those are only five um, for that weekend, so that's a that's a significantly reduced price option there. Um, I don't know that I've necessarily got a great answer why that landowner permit is that or uh, why that non-resident landowner permit is is that much more um, than the resident. I guess mo some of that. Think that those permits are set to be half of what the regular permit is so it's not yeah that's probably what um that is so it's it's probably more that 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 landowner permit is based on half of what the equivalent non-landowner permit cost is um so that's what the the price reduction is um so i guess that, i don't know that that's a great answer for you but that's the reason behind why that's permit is priced where it is um and those that type of uh Price structure, I believe, is set in statute. Um, so, uh, yeah, another, I, I just went through the point restrictions. Uh, oh, I'm still sharing. Oh, I didn't even finish that. Um, but yeah, we'll get back to that because Keaton asked a question about um, size. But when you start looking at the uh, um, what states report um, for their, their yearling box in the harvest, um, you know, ours at 22%, you know, is as good as, as any of the other, um, Midwest states, um, you know, for the, uh, for the percent of, of yearling bucks. And so again, it's just, uh, um, just not necessary, um, at this point. And, and like I said, would only predict or protect a, a small portion of our, of our deer. Oh man. Scrolled all the way down again. Uh, sorry, I'm sitting here scrolling back up trying to figure out where I'm at. All right. Um, But the Maynard had a comment, please close the fall turkey season and stop the aggressive advertising to try and lure out of state hunters. Um, yeah, actually that's one of the things we're, we're reducing our, our um, I think they're just advertising our, our, our marketing um, program is just advertising to resident turkey hunters um, this year. So they're actually not doing any non-resident um, turkey promotion. Um, and that's one of the things we will probably reduce the, the, the fall um, turkey harvest as well. That, that permit use is, uh, we're actually not taking very many fall turkeys anymore. That harvest has, has declined significantly. Um, let's see, we went through David's question about the special landowner season. Um, Joel said, thanks for doing this. Uh, thanks for joining us, Joel. Uh, Joseph had a question. Uh, what ways are you looking at helping to help the elk issue besides eradication um, with something like Montana's block management program where the fees go to help compensate landowners for damage? Um, would that be feasible? Um, we, we kind of have, have a similar program um, like that already uh, with our OFW program. Um, the block management is, is largely a, a, a walk-in program. It's, it's a more limited uh, program, but we already kind of do that. Um, we, we, we suggest that to every landowner um, that, that has damage. Um, and if they want to sign up, we'll do what we can to get them signed up. But a lot of those landowners haven't um, been interested in, in, in doing that. Um, season dates question, Ryan. Yeah, Brenton, I just covered that with uh, on turkeys. Yeah, that's something we're definitely looking at um, for reducing the fall turkey. Um, numbers, Andrew Carpenter had uh, five questions here. Um, can we limit the number of buck tags to only one? Um, yeah, I mean, it, that, that's something to consider. I, it's, you know, it, it would be reducing the opportunity. There's a lot of people that like to have um, two buck permits. I mean, ultimately it, it, 
it would have a small impact on quality. Um, I don't know that it would have the, the increase that everybody thinks. Um, uh, so increase in the out-of-state youth deer tags. Um, the way that those, like I mentioned before, the uh, we can only increase 6% per year or 18% um, over the, if it hasn't been increased in three years. Um, those permits, the price of those is actually $5 plus the $3 issuing fee. Um, so the most we could actually increase that is uh, what's 18% of $5. Um, so it would be 90 cents is the most we could increase. When we increased our, um, we're looking at permit increases a couple of years ago when we increased the non-resident permits, um, we looked at the youth and realized that we could only increase 90 cents legally and decided to leave it where it was that um, if we couldn't increase it at least a dollar, it was going to be hard. So, um, yeah, that's um, something to consider. It's it's going to be a difficult task to to increase that um, permit. But yeah, um, limit out of state tags. Surrounding state is difficult to obtain a tag, so everyone just comes to Nebraska. Uh, it's definitely something to consider. Something we're we're um, had discussions on um, just how to how to mitigate or, or, or limit some of the, the non-resident or deal with some of the non-resident issues that, that we're seeing, um, having seen that increase. Um, and a comment on the changes to the season choice. Yeah, we'll we'll continue. You know, with with reduced deer numbers, we'll look at those and we'll we'll adjust uh, permits and and some of the boundaries and and, and make changes to try to bring um, deer numbers back. It, it's a constant ebb and flow. Um, you know, the wild cards in it, you know, HD always throws a wrench in every everybody's plans. When we had HD in 2012, we reduced um, permits significantly. Um, and we'll, we'll take a look um, at that, you know, going forward here too. So thanks for that. Yep, we, Brian, we've expanded river tags. We've actually remove the Frenchman this year. We, we make changes to that, you know, based upon uh, what we think we might need to, to do. Um, uh, Maynard had a comment on shooting, not shooting in turkeys. Uh, that's a, Calvin's was the duplicate question of the non-resident landowner for elk. Um, Darren had a question with turkey numbers down. Is there any thought to limiting out-of-state permits? Um, yeah, that was part of, we, we had some discussions about that and we kind of wanted to see last year was kind of funny with, um, COVID 2020, um, and 2021 and all that, uh, we, we did see, a, a an increase in, um, non-residents last year. Um, we're kind of waiting to see what happens this year. If we have another increase, we'll probably, um, consider that. Um, Yeah, Cal, we kind of talked through that. Uh, Cody, any consideration of bringing back the prey tag from Mountain Lion uh, years past? Uh, Sam Wilson's our Mountain Lion biologist. I, Alicia, do you want to address any Mountain Lion stuff or do we want to just focus on the bird? <laughs> yeah, I can sure try. I, you know, at, at this point, we have not considered putting the prey tag back for Mountain Lions, mostly because it doesn't really fit within the management plan that we have set forth, um, which is trying to make sure we have a viable population before we in, institute a hunt in a certain unit. So right now we only have hunting in the Pine Ridge unit and we're exploring kind of next the Niobrara area for a, a new unit there. Um, and we'll have some more information coming soon. We actually are in the middle of doing some more research in the Niobrara area to see uh, what the population counts are and if there is any reproduction in that area. So let's see, next question on there. Is there any public data info on verified mountain lion sightings encounters that should be, that information should be on our website under mountain lions. If you wanna go take a look at that, that's the verified um, sightings that, that we have um, evidence from. And so you can see that on our websites. Um, 
I do believe there has been some in Knox County. I'd have to kind of look again as far as sightings in that area. Sam, we can also take your information and make sure, you know, Sam maybe gets back to you if you want to just uh, direct message me, Cody, your email address. I can have um, Sam respond back to you too. Alicia, yeah, this is Lucas. We, we've got Cody's uh, reports from, from Mitch Johnson and Sam's been in, in communication with him. So, yep. Okay. Thanks, Lucas. Yep. And you might clarify the, the Niobrara is not necessarily the town of Niobrara, but the I'm Niobrara sorry. Yeah. The, the Niobrara, there would be like a Niobrara unit, which, you know, I don't think we have boundaries established necessarily for that exactly, but um, we're looking in the Niobrara River area. Uh, for the populations of mountain lions through a trail cam, scat surveys, and some uh, trapping and collaring. All right, thanks, Alicia. Yeah. Let's see. Um, Reagan had a question. Shouldn't there be more control or limited access to walk-in land for big game? Um, we're, we've actually looked at some of the potential different programs um, to have limited access um, to some of those, uh, you know, just a, a different program, you know, than, than open OFW um, that some other states do like that block management or Kansas does something similar. Um, we've looked into that. They keep uh, having discussions on that, but that's definitely an option um, for, for some of that pressure or some landowners that just don't want to free for all open access. Um, the, the difficult thing is in a state that's only 3% um, public land like we are, um, it's, it's difficult to, to limit access to, to, our, to our own public land. So um, comment from David, it's a high probability the number of out-of-state hunters allowed uh, in Nebraska makes it difficult for Nebraska residents to obtain permission to hunt, uh, find land to hunt on. Yep, that's, that's one of the things we've seen, one of our concerns too. Um, in trying to figure out this, this, the, you know, the issues that we're facing with the increases in, in non-resident hunters. So yeah, um, good point. Uh, Craig came up and archery hunted antelope in uh, 2020. He was unsuccessful with saw antelope. Did a scouting contact landowners for the 2021 season. Uh, wasn't staying current on regulations in August. Came around surprised when I went online and purchased. Saw the non-resident archery tags were limited last year. Appreciate and respect management of wildlife. Um, Canceled and said our non-resident archery antelope tags on first come, uh, first serve basis this year also. Um, that's our plan. Um, I don't think we're going to change that. That seemed to to help alleviate um, a lot of that archery pressure. Um, that that are, and the reason for that our non-resident archery um, permit is the really the only um, permit that allows non-residents to come hunt antelope in the state, and that number has increased like sixfold since 2010. Um, and had doubled over the last two years. It had stabilized at about 250 um, and then went to like uh, 370 and then 540 um, in 2020. And we had a lot of complaints that just with the sheer increase of, of, of hunters that it was impacting, um, not just the, it had a significant impact to the, um, North Sioux, but also, you know, across the, across the panhandle, um, people saw increases. And so that was um, our response to just basically set it back, um, go back to what that, uh, that number that seemed fairly comfortable. And um, I guess anecdotally, you know, I've taken a number of reports from people that, that, that we had a, um, it was a much, much more peaceful hunt up on the grasslands and not quite the, the issues that we were having um, elsewhere as well. So yeah, that's this the point. Is Luke, this is one of the units that we're thinking about making a, or this is one of the tags we're thinking about making into a draw, not yeah. this, but the, maybe the following year. Yeah. Yeah. Those permits that sell out fast like that, we really should be a draw um, just so it's not a, a necessarily a, a complete race to the computer on some of those. So yeah, that's one of the things that, that will likely be a draw in the future, but this year it'll, it should still be over the, over the counter when those go on sale. Um, Maynard asked, has the Upland Game Manager held meetings like this one, pheasants, quail, and desperate need of help? They actually did one about a month ago for the new pheasant um, management plan. Um, so yeah, they just they just did one. Um, 
Jeremy, uh, was the antelope herd in the grasslands area hit hard with EHD? Um, I guess I don't know specifics up there. Most of our EHD and antelope um, reports we had were in the southern panhandle. Um, and our, I think our antelope numbers were fairly decent for our, our survey numbers that we did this, this last summer in August, which a little before that EHD would have, would have hit. We're, we're pretty decent up there. Um, but I don't think, I guess I don't know if any of our panhandle guys are on here, but I don't know that we had any reports out on the grassland um, on pronghorn. And that, that map. Hey, Luke, this is Hunter. Yes. Yeah. We didn't have any reports of the HD up there. Okay. Uh, most were kind of in the central panhandle and a one in the southern. So things look all right up there, but some other units we were definitely concerned with. Yep. Thanks, Hunter. All right, Bill, my question in regards to lengthening the January animal season um, is due to concern over hunter density crowding with the two week season. Um, understand land or tolerance is a concern, but if deer are causing crop damage in a longer season, should increase antlers harvest and alleviate issues. In my experience, lengthening the season significantly reduced the impact of hunter crowding. Hunter experience is also a factor. Cramming lots of hunters into a short season reduces the quality of the hunt. And I agree with you on that, Bill. Um, that's one of the reasons we we lengthen that river antlerless um, season. But yeah, I would I would agree with you on that. And that's something that's that that we have to. Uh, that we consider um, or that we're looking at, but yeah, for sure. Um, let's see, some of these are repeats. Um, how can you get faster testing results for CWD? So if you animal test positive, you're not spending a lot on processing fees. Um, some of that is, you know, ultimately up to the, the, the lab that we're working through. Um, they can only process so many um, so many samples at a time. Um, and I guess that my suggestion would be is if you're getting a, a deer um, tested for CWD, you know, stick that thing in the freezer, you know, don't go get it processed until, um, until you know for sure. I mean, if there's a chance you could end up throwing that or finding a reason to throw that deer out, um, I would wait on getting it processed. Um, but yeah, speeding that up is going to be, it, it's, that's difficult. We're at the mercy of the lab um, for getting that. Part of our problem, I think this year with the lab was some COVID issues that were going on and it held, held oh, up. Yeah. That's right. That did, that limited their staff. And I, and I, was, was there a supply issue too or something? Alicia? Not this year. That was a couple that, years ago. Okay. Now we have enough supply, but we, the staff. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that was that was our hiccup this year. Normally, we get a lot of our results by early to mid December, and stuff was just a lot slower this year. Um, let's see. Uh, Preston, I support efforts to improve the age structure so there are more older deer, including changes to season weapon choice age restrictions. Um, it's important to maintain rifle hunt for youth during Thanksgiving break. Yeah, and see that the, the, the firearm season during Thanksgiving um, is going to be an entirely love-hate relationship. Um, the people that want it would love it. Um, I think most of the moms in Nebraska would hang me if we went to a, uh, a firearm season during Thanksgiving. Um, I'm not entirely opposed it, to it, but I don't want to be the one that does it. <laughs> Um, for that reason, I, yeah, I, I get that. Like Thanksgiving would be a good time, but man, it, giving guys a reason to get out of the house on Thanksgiving or stay away for the entire weekend, um, would get me in a lot of trouble. Um, so that's a tough one. I, I get the sentiment. I, it's, it's an opportunity, but there's, there's some, there's some roadblocks in, in that. Um, but yeah, I, that's that's a definitely a thought. Uh, Jeffrey Nunner is an archery deer hunter. Always had great experience. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, a lot of pressure in the Pine Ridge opening week and weren't successful. Um, yeah, until only suggestion is consider antler point restriction. Yeah, and yeah, we've we've kind of hashed over that. But for the most part, we don't shoot shoot a whole lot of uh, 
young bucks um, for the most part. Um, Cal, why do we have unlimited deer tags that are killing half so many deer as Iowa and Kansas? Uh, why is not limited quota for every unit with smaller units to help manage um, deer herd better? Um, you know, a lot of that comes down to the, you know, Nebraska is a conservative state. Um, you know, the, the smaller units, the unit size, you know, there, there's some benefit to that in managing, you know, doe numbers. Um, but, you know, ultimately we want you all to have the freedom to hunt where you want to hunt. We don't want you to, we don't want to confine you to a, a small patch. You know, if you, a lot of people have place to hunt spread out over a couple counties, um, We'd rather you not have to buy, you know, two separate permits to, to go hunt those if, if, if not at all necessary. Um, you know, so that's, that's part of it. Um, you know, and, and when it comes to the, the deer numbers, you know, ultimately that's deer numbers um, in an area that's up to the hunters and the landowners to figure out what's the right number of deer that they can support. You know, uh, if landowners want fewer deer, we, you know, we kind of got to work towards that goal. Um, and that ultimately that's, you know, why Kansas and Iowa have more, um, you know, have higher deer number, deer numbers and deer harvest. They'll just tolerate and have better habitat, um, than, than we do. Um, oh yeah, a question on, uh, Belf, that's a, there, there's a few places where school lands, um, are open. Um, we signed them up for our OFW program, but. Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, requiring that to be public access, you know, the, the, those lands are, are meant to, to uh, raise money for the school system. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's, a, that's a, a tough hill to climb for sure. Um, yeah, support more uh, increase to walk in. Yeah, like Alicia said, we're, we're doing everything we can to try, try to um, increase that OFW program. Um, Ryan's asked, I, sorry, I don't really have any idea. They asked, what is the plan for fire prevention in the Pine Ridge area? I, I don't really have, um, that's not really our um, area of expertise. Um, Craig, our turkey population in Missouri is down as well. Yeah, population seems to start yeah, nest predators are definitely um, part of it. Uh, a lot of, you know, this Nebraska is not alone. Missouri is not alone. Almost every state across the East um, has seen similar turkey declines. Um, some of them significantly more than what Nebraska and Missouri have seen. Um, some of it's probably timber um, management, just the, the, the habitat has changed. Um, but yeah, predators are part of it. Um, there's a lot of turkey biologists um, we all meet together and, and, and talk about these things and nobody has a really good answer um, for it. Everybody's seen, you know, essentially the same thing. Um, we're all kind of on a, a very similar curve of, of seeing turkey numbers decline. Um, so, you know, there's no doubt that habitat and predators are, are, are playing a role in it. Um, Mary asks, has there been any deer with COVID in the state? We're actually in the process of using um, we're working with the university to try to test um, some of our CWD samples um, for COVID just to, to see um, if we've picked it up yet. To this point, we've not tested any deer yet. Um, I don't know when that's going to happen. Um, and we'll be calling um, those hunters uh, with those um, that submitted those CWD samples um, before we ever test them to get their permission to do it um, so that they're aware that that test is being done. Um, so we've got some work to do before any of that testing happens, but that's something that's, that we're definitely trying to look at, um, but we're a little ways down the road before we get any of that done. Um, just said, we say we're aggressive in the Frenchman reason or region. Um, yeah, coyotes. Um, oh, let's see. Let me read that all. A uh, non-resident has hunted in Nebraska for 11 years. After talking to some farmers, several complained to us and told us to shoot any coyote we saw because they are killing the cattle. They said the deer usually kept the coyotes away. We only saw 12 deer the entire week. Uh, and they were all small deer. It seems like there was a major eradication in the region. Um, two deer in two years between eight hunters is not good stats. Um, years prior to these two years, uh, we were at least 50% successful. 
uh, was change or continue to decrease in this region. Um, it's something we'll adjust uh, and, and, and look at, at making changes to our analyst permits to, to try to bring, bring numbers to, to where people want them. Um, but we, you know, that was something we, we dealt with some major depredation complaints, particularly on the, um, the, the mule deer in that Hayes and uh, Frontier counties. Um, where we've got that Frenchman West permit, as well as along the, the river with whitetails. Um, we still had depredation um, along that for a long time, and that's seemed to dry it up uh, rather quickly. So um, that's part of the reason for getting rid of that river antlers permit in there. So we'll continue making changes to try to get that, um, that refined. Uh, Preston, comment, thanks a lot to the staff and commissioners for being open to public input, which is often contentious. I can see an easier process for hunters to submit CBD samples during archery season. Um, I did last year and it was not user-friendly dealing with the you know, lab. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, the yeah, funding to try to fund that um, or submitting um, samples is, is a trick. I, I guess I'd be interested in knowing what was the uh, not user-friendly part. I, it may be, I, I submitted one here a few years ago and all I had to do is just drop it off, which that's, it is a bit of a hassle, but um, yeah. And that's something that I, I think that our CWD plan will, will be working towards is trying to um, help streamline some of that. Um, stay in Cuba, will there be a three day early landowner season this year? Uh, there's no plans to change that at all. Um, that's set in statute and unless the legislature changes it, that's not going anywhere. Um, Steven, son-in-law shot a six by eight last season in the Panhandle area. Great hunting experience. Uh, thanks. Um, let's see, Maynard, nest predators, red fox and hawks. Yep. You know, there's a whole host of things, but yeah. I had a comment on, I assume that's about Iowa. Um, oh, Carl's getting off, we got Lyle. Uh, Tate said, having a straight draw is way better option than a point system where there is point creep, which deters applying um, due to not having points. Yeah. The, um, the different draws, you know, there, there's, you know, whether it's just a straight lottery, a preference point or a bonus point, um, they each have their sweet spot where they work. If you've got way, way more applicants um, than permits, you know, a lottery is the way to go. Um, you know, if your odds are, are really slim, if, if you have something where you can plan on getting a permit every, you know, two to six years, preference point works um, pretty good. You start getting up to 10. Um, and making those weights a long time. That's when a bonus um, starts working a little better. Um, but yeah, the, there's there's kind of a sweet spot for, for each of those types. Um, Richard had the comment, can we have non-resident bow hunting start after the November firearm season? Um, it's definitely a thought. I think, you know, I don't know if a lot of people would be real happy with that. I think some of it, but part of it is, you know, that we're, we're looking at is trying to how we can reduce the, the overall number of, of non-resident hunters or at least address um, those increases. So, but yeah, there's, there's definitely things to look at and consider there. Um, Tom, uh, anything about game cameras like other states starting to ban them? Um, can see it on cell phones, but not regular ones. Um, I guess in, in short, no, we, that's not something we've really considered um, at all. Where you've seen these, uh, states banning trail cameras, um, you know, whether it's Montana, particularly, you know, Utah and Arizona, um, they have, for one, they, they have entirely different um, issues than what we might face or what we could ever face here in Nebraska um, with, you know, a lot of public land. Um, but in those states, water is critically important. And if you go to, a, and they have what they, they refer to them as tanks, and they're basically just dugouts, um, some of them that they can, they can fill, but they hold water. Um, in, in a lot of those drier uh, regions, and you'll walk up to one of those tanks, um, and there, there might be 15 cameras on it. Uh, and just with the um, constant checking of cameras, they're disturbing, you know, elk um, off of the, uh, 
elk and mule deer and everything else off of these critical water sources um, and having an influence. Um, and they had seen, you know, the, the deer had started and elk had all started visiting these sites at nighttime. You know, not at, they went from using them during the day to not at all, um, just strictly because of the human presence there. Um, that's one of the issues, just the impact on the wildlife was, was one of the major issues um, that they were seeing out there. The other thing that they were seeing pop up was with these cell cameras, um, they were having people selling the location of photos taken um, of trophy animals on the internet saying, hey, I've got this picture. It was from this morning. It's yours for $5,000. I'll give you the location or whatever the price was they were putting on it. Um, that's an issue that, I, for one, we, we won't necessarily face that, um, partly, you know, because we don't have the public land um, that, that they do. Um, so those are the, the primary issues that just that disturbance and that idea of selling locations of animals um, that led to the, that banning um, of, of trail cameras in, in those states. Uh, those are issues that we just, we simply don't face. Um, so I, I don't foresee that, that occurring. Um, let's see. Let's see. Jeff had a, uh, being a non-resident, uh, hunter and hunting public land where the locals threatening us, telling us to leave the area and go hunt somewhere else. Uh, I'm sorry. You're getting that experience from people by and large. That's not the Nebraska way. Um, I think some of it is, and, and you'll see, you see some of that, uh, um, context is just that we, we've kind of gotten to the point where we've probably got um, either enough or too many non-resident hunters within the state that, that we've only got um, so much limited opportunity that we can provide. And um, some of our residents are getting um, tired of having um, more and more non-residents um, and particularly using um, our public land. So it's, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I apologize and I'm sorry that you, uh, you had that experience, um, but that's probably where that's, that's coming from. Um, let's see, if we have less deer than surrounding states, why does every unit not only have limited quotas with no statewide tags and draws for non-residents? Uh, well, our, our unit permits are limited quota. Um, we just, we, we do have uh, um, some of those statewide permits. Um, some of them are limited, some of them aren't. Um, just because that opportunity, because that's uh, what a lot of our hunters um, like to use. But yeah, that's, that's definitely a, a, a difficult um, thing for managing deer within some of those units. Um, let's see. Andrew asks, what's the plan with the elk bonus point system? I understand that several people have the max points in the state, but a lot of people draw tags for the first time. Um, those, that bonus point system is actually working um, there are a few people that draw um, with with single points, but um, that's actually got that. Got a copy of it right here. Um, our draw odds. It's actually on our website on the draw results page. Let me see if I can um, pull that up real quick. Um, but by and large, the 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 uh, so. Let me share this real quick. There's, if you go to our website, outdoornebraska.gov backslash draw results, it's got our draw results from the last four years. Um, if you haven't seen that, and I go through. Um, so we can look at the draw results. I, I break it down. I'm not going to bore you too much with it, uh, but I, I break it down. Um, so the, the overall draw odds, if everybody had the same opportunity, your, your odds um, would be here. Our, our permits are largely going. You can see that zero point pool um, had, a, had a large percentage of the applicants compared to these upper pools. They drew 19 um, uh, total permits, which is, they, they drew a little higher rate than they should have. The seven point pool, despite being basically you know, a third of what um, that zero point pool was drew more permits. So they're, they're drawing at a rate a lot higher than what, um, you know, the, their percent, the zero point pool percent success was 1.4% success. That seven point pool, 
pool drew at a 6.7% rate. So the, the system is working. It gives those people who've been in the system um, applying the longest, the best odds, um, but it still provides everybody the opportunity um, to draw. So um, I don't see us going away from that. Um, it's, it's been um, working what we, what we need to do. Uh, oh no, it scrolled all the way back down for me. Go to 8.11 p.m. 8.11 p.m. 8.11, oh man. I don't know. I don't know how long we wanna stick on here. Um, we, we are at nine o'clock. I wanna be respectful of everybody's time, but we can keep going for a little while longer. It looks like we've lost a handful of people. Um, Steve, question, came across a down buck in Sacramento near, near, near Holdridge and called the game warden, field dressed it and it was green inside. Um, has there been any more reports of that disease in Nebraska? I don't know what that, um, what that might've been. If it's green, it's probably more than likely an injury of some sort. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know exactly what that, what that would have been. Um, Cal asked, what is the number of white-tailed deer per acre uh, in the prominent areas? Obviously, the sand hills wouldn't be part of that. We actually don't generate population estimates. Um, most states don't generate uh, real fine-scale um, deer population estimates. Part of it is those estimates are really expensive to calculate. Um, ultimately, then you need to decide what the number is that you want to have there um, to figure out how many you need to harvest. Um, using social tolerances of, you know, do our landowners want fewer or more deer? Do our hunters want fewer or more? And then trying to balance that um, has worked um, pretty good for us. Um, so yeah, we, we haven't uh, generated um, estimates like that. Um, Dean had a, con a question. I'm a landowner, uh, work with several other landowners in my area to improve the health of the deer. We're putting out mineral from Cabela's during the spring and summer. We've seen marked improvement in the size, health, and rack size. However, a local NGPC officer told us it was illegal because uh, we're baiting deer, so we stopped. Is it really illegal? Uh, so how comes Cabela sells it? You can't um, hunt over bait. You can feed deer. Um, you just can't hunt um, within 200 yards um, of, a, of a baited area. Um, and so that's one of the things. We, if, you, if you've got supplemental feeds out there, uh, you got to be careful that you're, you're obeying the... Uh, the, that law in, in particular. Some states it's legal to hunt over bait. Some states it's it, in Nebraska, it's not. Um, how come Cabela sells it? If any of people will buy it, most places will sell it. Um, so uh, Mason, I'm not sure it's been mentioned yet. We have all considered creating limitations for crossbow hunters due to a clear advantage. Um, we haven't yet. We've We've seen increases in crossbow hunter numbers. Um, we haven't seen the increases that other states have. Um, you know, we, we used to have, crossbows used to be, you know, only uh, by permit only. Um, it was included in, into archery in about 10 years ago now. Um, we haven't seen increases in archery harvest um, over that time. Um, just a, a, a lot of it is, our older archers switching over to um, over the crossbows has, has been part of it. Um, I, I really don't want to get into the lion stuff here. That I'm I'm not the expert on that. Those would be questions for Sam. Um, Tom, what about starting bobcat season when fire and deer starts? Uh, again, that's another fur bear question for Sam. I don't I don't really. Um, I guess I have a lot of input or expertise on that. Uh, Aaron, can yeah, we get a Tom. season puzzle? Huh? Sorry, we'll take it down in the comments and we can also work okay. with Sam. <laughs> yeah, we'll try to get information for you there. Um, we get a muzzleloader season for pronghorn different than firearm. They're just as hard to hunt with that weapon. Uh, we do have a muzzleloader uh, pronghorn season that's the like two weeks before. I guess, I'm, Aaron, I'm not exactly understanding that question. We've got a separate muzzleloader season um, right now. It starts like the last one of the uh, 
last Saturday. It goes for 16 days there at the end of uh, September and early October. I would say over the counter is what I meant. Oh, uh, partly because of the success, uh, we simply couldn't support the um, the the success rate on our on our muzzleloaders. About is between 50 and 60 percent typically, whereas archery is between 10 and 15 percent. Um, especially with the advancements in technology and muzzleloader, they're not a whole lot different than a firearm as far as range goes. Um, I mean, there's a lot of antelope, you know. 150 to 200 yards with a muzzleloader is pretty easy. Um, Calvin asks, New Mexico takes into account habitat improvements on property when allocating landowner tags. Has this ever been considered? Um, not, not really. Uh, most our, our landowner um, seasons are set in set in statute, and those those qualifications are set um, uh, there in statute. Um, so we, we haven't necessarily looked at, uh, those habitat improvements. Um, Steven, please address the use of telecheck last season and accuracy of the 2020 harvest data. Um, also not requiring in-person check-in on archery muzzleloader and bites dishonesty and poaching. Um, yeah, I suppose, you know, there's, there's that, you know, all of this, and even the, the in-person check doesn't eliminate, you know, a lot of our check stations, you know, only that opening weekend, um, or the ones that our offices are, are manned by our staff, and none of our staff that are manning those are officers. Um, it's all wildlife biologists. Um, the, the purpose of the, the check stations, there's a, law enforcement is a small part of it. I mean, the law enforcement, um, not, you know, it's not the law enforcement of looking at every deer, but just having that registered harvest and having that information from those hunters. Um, you know, our, the, the primary purpose, you know, of our check stations, you know, for one is to get that harvest uh, information, um, you know, as well as collecting, you know, disease samples, as well as having that interaction with, with the hunters and, and, and all that. Um, but I mean, there, there's, yeah, our, our data is only as honest as our hunters um, are, and, you know, so there's, you know, some of those issues are, that are always going to be there, but yeah. Um, oh, Brian's doing my math for me there. $3 issue fee, yeah, 18%, 90 cents, yep. Um, Stan really liked the early rifle season for landowners. Uh, Mason, how do we promote the use of quality land management, including uh, running trail cameras to grow bigger deer? Um, yeah, you know, some of that, it's just ultimately it comes up to the, down to what the hunters want to do. If they want to, um, you know, go through all that and, you know, and, and make that a part of their um, deer hunting and, and trophy hunt, people are absolutely free to do that. Um, you know, there's also a lot of people that, you know, aren't full-time deer hunters. Um, that, that do a number of things, you know, so we, we want to encourage uh, people to hunt deer how they want to hunt deer, um, but yeah. A um, couple lion questions or comments, I guess. Um, Cody says, thanks for the information. Hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, Moose says, what is the criteria for a landowner to be issued a depredation permit? Um, what do they do with the deer when they shoot? And how's the game of parks monitoring the amount of deer killed? Um, criteria, you know, we work with the landowners to make sure that they've got damage occurring um, and that they're, uh, they're allowing um, reasonable access um, for hunters to, to um, try to reduce those populations and um, those depredation, those damage control permits um, are issued through our staff. Um, we're generally fairly, um, heavily involved with those, um, the issuing of those, um, they have to report what they've, what they've taken. Um, and it's, it's required by law that those deer be offered for human consumption. So those deer that you are getting used, um, they're not just being left and or shot and left. Um, so we, we work with them, you know, we, we do back our law enforcement staff does background checks on the people that might be named as, as shooters if they have additional people other than just the landowner. And, and even the landowner goes through that background check as well. So, and Luke, just to add to that, they aren't allowed to sell that permit. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Can't be commercialized in any way. 
So the, the antlers, if, if it's a permit that that allows for the harvest of, of males, um, the antlers are, are uh, returned to the agency. They can't keep the antlers on those. Um, let's see, Todd asked, what about deer feeders on private ground bordering walk-in land? Any way to check or control that? Um, and that's the hard thing with private land property rights in Nebraska. What people do on their property is is up to them. Um, so and yeah, the, baiting, the baiting regulation only pertains to land that is owned or leased by the person that is doing the feeding or baiting. So a person next door to you doing it, that's not your control. So it wouldn't be fair to necessarily limit the other person. Um, Craig, comment. Thanks for your response. And uh, for the working man, draws work better than sitting on a computer. I agree. That's that's one of the comments we've been getting. Um, thanks for that. Shannon's suggestion would uh, be to have more of these Zoom meetings in the future to address statewide concerns versus different implications. Uh, might allow for more questions to be answered. Yeah, um, that's what. Last year we did eight of them, and I didn't want to do eight. Um, that was a really long week. Um, Doing one, I would agree. This is probably a little much. Um, and yeah, I, we'll, we'll look at it in, in future next year. We might, we'll probably do at least two of them next year to try to break them up. Um, you guys have done a phenomenal job asking questions um, and sticking with us. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, Brian, in regards to CWD, CWD, you do not spend a ton of money just for testing, spend it on research to help us figure out solutions, um, not just uh, to know whether we have it or not. Uh, thanks for that comment. Um, uh, Joseph, thanks for the meeting. Uh, MG Game of Parks commissioners and staff, hey, thanks for joining us, Joseph. Um, a lot of so this, very informative. Uh, thanks for giving us the time to comment, learn concerns. Uh, thanks again. Yeah, thank you, Lyle. Um, Kyle, you might have to explain that. What does the political party matter to the deer herd? I have no idea. I just met with the um, conserv conservative state, excuse me, is all I meant by that. I was just wondering if you were oh. wondering, considering like Iowa and Kansas to be more blue states than red states. Oh, I, I wasn't was necessarily meaning it as a, you know, red state, blue state, but Nebraska is a conservative state, meaning that we generally don't like um, government telling us what to do in that regard. And so that's, that's where I'm coming from. But, you know, I guess in, in a way that means we tend to lean a little more red, um, but that's not to, to point fingers. We just, people of Nebraska generally don't like government bureaucrats or people like me telling them what they can and shoot. And I, I think for the most part, um, most of us within the agency would agree with that. We don't, we, we want you to have the freedom to, to shoot the deer that makes you happy. So, you know, that's, that's, that's all part of it. Um, let's see, Mark. Uh, maybe this has been touched on, but there's been any effort made to increase public land hunting where Nebraska. Yeah, Alicia talked on that a little earlier. Our OFW program, we're always trying to increase that. And um, our partner section staff um, and John Locks, they've done an incredible job. I, I don't know the stats offhand, but they've they've tripled the the size of that program in like the last five or 10 years. That that program has grown by leaps and bounds. Um, and they're they're constantly trying to find ways to um, to, to increase it more. Um, Steven had a cow elk permit for the North Platte River unit and filled it, test positive for CWD. Uh, what can be done for me um, for a depredation commit permit for the North Platte uh, unit this coming season? Um, unfortunately, we really don't have a, um, a great structure for doing any, you know, and, and our CWD testing has never been, the, the intent there is, is, is you know, just simply sampling um, so that we understand what that disease, it's never been a, a, a meat quality assurance um, program, unfortunately. Um, you know, I mean, right now we've, we've tested only about half of, um, 
half of the elk. So there's, you know, likely some CWD positives, you know, and then we know that in, in that we, we only sampled for deer, a small portion of it. So we, we can't possibly afford to be a, a meat testing um, facility um, for people. But, you know, that, that's a, it, it's a good question. It might be something that's better suited for giving us a call, Stephen, on that. Um, David, uh, the amount of elk there's leasing land, limit access to Nebraska hunters and opportunities for youth to hunt. Um, can you consider limitations for number of outfitters and the amount of land they can lease? Um, yeah, we, we haven't taken um, too many steps to uh, regulate outfitters in the state. I don't know that we could ever do anything to limit the amount of land that they could lease um, and all that. That's uh, definitely a, a something to consider there. But it, it, it's a tough, that's a tough situation. Um, all around. Um, Steve had a comment on crossbows. Yeah, crossbows evoke a lot of opinions on people or from people. Um, Robert, out of state hunter, but wife's family's farm and cousin's farm. Um, he should always be able to hunt. Uh, no one in the family hunts but him, 65 years old. Um, a lot of anti out of state negative uh, hunting out, or hunting negativity. Yeah, and yeah, Robert, like I mentioned earlier, part of that is we, we've kind of just reached a threshold within the state from a lot of our residents um, have, have felt the, the, the squeeze on that. I, I'm sorry you felt you know, negativity from that. Um, you know, so it's, it's just one of those things that we're trying to balance um, in, in managing deer. Yeah, agree, John. And I, I, man, all of our commissioners we have on here, John wrote two hours in, we still have almost 100 people still on. Um, it's obvious you care, thanks. Um, and I would agree. I, I appreciate everybody that's still here. This is awesome. Um, yeah. Chad, had a, Chad had a comment on the uh, early landowner deer season. Um, yeah, thanks for your comments there. Uh, Keith, any consideration to given to eliminating deer urine uh, use to possible disease issues. Um, that was actually one of the questions that we asked in our um, CWD uh, survey. Um, th that's a possibility. You know, when we get to the point of um, putting together our CWD plan, we, um, we encourage everybody to, to be involved. You know, when that info starts um, being out, that might be uh, um, something worth considering for sure. Uh, Hey, thanks for joining us, Jeremy. Um, Brian, I think that's Brian. Brian, I think you misspelled your name, but that's I think that's Brian from UNK. So saying thanks for taking time to provide all the information. Hey, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, Joseph's explaining some of the landowner stuff. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us, Ryan. Um, Yeah, Jeff, on the, I don't know that there's any way that we can look at how long people, non-residents have, have hunted here. Um, ultimately, it, it probably comes down, if, if necessary, it comes down to a draw. That's why it, some of those, it's, it's for, for guys like you that are on the ball and been doing it, you know how to do it, um, doing that over the counter, um, permit, you know, some of those, keeping some of those permits over the counter. Um, that gives you an opportunity to get it every year than strictly going straight to a draw for everything. So, um, let's see, Brian, Team Parks considered allowing the new fire stick technology for muzzleloader hunting. Um, we get that question a lot, and you know, ultimately, it's it's breech loaded, and so it's, it doesn't fit our definition of a of a muzzleloader. Um, I mean, it's, the bullet goes down the muzzle, but you know, at this point, we, we probably won't um, address it just be, because it's breech loaded um, in that regard. Um, Dean said the local uh, Union Parks officers and their immediate families won the elk lotteries. Oh. Um, 
Yeah, I can tell you, I've sat in that room um, when those permits are drawn. There's nothing that picks out Game and Parks. There's no possible way um, to identify Game and Parks employees for drawing elk permits. Um, some of it is that we have a lot of Game and Parks uh, employees and family and their families um, putting in for permits. Um, actually, I suspect I know the family that you are uh, talking about, and they, I don't think they've drawn one in the last two years. Um, so yeah, we, we we all don't like them either. Um, I I sit in that same um, category. I've put in for Nebraska elk permits almost every year that I've been eligible that I've been um, living in the state. Um, was born here. I didn't apply when I was real little, um, but applied through the early 2000s. And then as soon as I moved back, I've never drawn an elk permit. So I'm one of those people that um, if there was a way to cheat the system, I would hope that I would be able to figure it out. And it, I, I can assure you that that drawing is fair. It's arbitrary. Um, it, it's, it's unbiased in that. Um, it, I know sometimes it doesn't always seem like it, um, but I, I can assure you that it's, it's impartial. Um, and, and, and there's a few of our staff that have drawn permits that if I had a choice, they wouldn't get a permit. So <laughs> I'm joking. Um, but yeah, that, that system works as it should. Um, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, Tate had a question about the muzzleloaders and those changes. Oh, we, the reason we haven't made any changes to, you know, they've improved in um, technology, they've improved in range. We haven't seen an increase in our muzzleloader harvest. Um, it hasn't had a negative impact um, in a lot of our, in our um, units. We, obviously, we've made some of those changes in the MDCA where we've lumped those permits together or limited the statewide um, permits. Um, but that, that much has, has seemed to, to work. Um, we haven't had to, to restrict the technology yet just because that, that harvest hasn't increased. So if it, if it does, if we see that, that's something we'll definitely look at. But yeah, thanks for that comment, Tate. Um, oh, Dean's got some feedback on the, the baiting question. I think his question, it, you know, we, we recently just clarified that and there was some confusion across the state from law enforcement on when that ban should start with the way it was worded previously. So we've tried to clarify that in regulations and that was just recently this summer just to say that you can't hunt within 200 yards of bait. And so that kind of took out the, well, when does that start? Because it used to be like at the start of the big game season or, you know, and that include included Turkey. So I think there was some confusion on that, which is why we tried to clarify that most recently. So hopefully that won't become an issue. It's just really related to whether you're hunting and how close you are to that bait on your own property. I hope that that regulation does help Dean with that clarification. It was something that we worked with our law enforcement division in writing so that everybody could um, hopefully enforce that a little better across the state. Alicia, question or comment. My understanding is that that moved it from 30 days prior to the big game season to all evidence of the, of the outside source or materials need to be removed for 10 days and after 10 days you can hunt that area but the, all the all the all the mineral feed has to be gone for at least minimum of 10 days is that correct yeah, that's correct john yeah that's correct but it's it was more you know it's, it's been it was that 30 days prior to a big game season and now it's just you know that 200 yards and if it is removed completely then it's the 10 days so yeah that's right Um, let's see. The next one, Jared, uh, Game and Parks does seek public help to have access for collaring mountain lions, not so much help collaring the lions themselves. So if you have a place where you know there could be lions that we might want to collar them, especially in the Niobrara River Valley, where we are currently collaring, we would be interested in that in that information, but we don't necessarily take volunteers along with us when we're collaring. Um, 
So there isn't really a list for that if that's what you're talking about. But Sam Wilson is the contact for if you have land or access to land. Jeff, Jeff C. Hey, thanks for thanks for your input and questions. Um, Doug, yeah, yeah, you're right. That that landowner season came at the request of, of landowners. Um, yeah, and and yeah, some of that, or or the the reasons for that, you know, were a, a lot just to provide them the the opportunity to hunt, um, since we do have a such a condensed um, season. But yeah. So yeah, I agree. It's definitely served a served its purpose. Um, uh, Tate, or yeah, or, sorry, skip down. Jeff, yeah, thanks for thanks for joining us. Um, Tate, why not just allow baiting? Um, some of that, you know, just comes down to there, there's a whole. I mean, I think if you asked on this whole group, there would be a we, we would range the whole host of of that. Um, you know, some of it is, you know, there's disease concerns, some of it's fair chase um, concerns, you know, there's just opinions across the, the whole gamut of that. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, so I don't know that I've got a great answer for that. Just that that's a, a polarizing question. Um, Ryan, any consideration to including non-agricultural food plots, the same as baiting deer? Um, how's this any different than hunting over a mineral or a supplement pile? Um, the, the big difference is once a food plot is eaten, it's gone. Or if you're, you have a dry year, um, you know, you, you got to be able to grow the food for the deer to use it. So you're kind of at the mercy of um, how much food you can produce right there on that site. Whereas a corn pile, uh, you could put out hundred bushels every day if if you had deep enough pockets um and wanted to do that um you know that's the difference the other thing is the the size difference so if you've only got you know most bait piles are only over a small area um you know from the disease standpoint whereas you know a food plot if you've got a quarter acre food plot it's not going to feed deer for very long or very many deer um period but if you're constantly putting out feed um that you know you can feed a hundred deer for an entire winter um you know, in a small area if you wanted. So that's, that's the main difference. Um, so uh, Blaine, yeah, th that's definitely something. And, and we, some of our staff have talked to the Bureau of Education and Land um, about some of that, um, but yeah. So that's, that's definitely a, a popular comment would open up a lot of um, public access, but there's definitely hurdles to, to getting that done. Um, and thank you for joining us, Blaine. Um, appreciate you, you, you coming tonight. Um, yep, thank you, Brian. And thanks, thanks, Tate. I can't believe we actually caught up on questions. That's amazing. That was a marathon. Good job, Luke. Hey. Go have a oh, beer. Yeah. <laughs> I got to drive home yet. So no, that's, I, I do appreciate, um, I guess if anybody will, I'll, I'll blather on here for a few more minutes if anybody else thinks of any questions, otherwise we'll kind of wrap up. Um, but no, I appreciate everybody um, joining us. Um, I think you all probably got an email or my email address um, within uh, your notification of getting um, your invitation to join us tonight. So if you think of questions or have comments or anything, man, shoot me an email. I get emails all the time. Um, and I, I'll respond to you. I, I respond to emails a lot. I, when we took comments for our elk management plan, I, I responded to every one of the um, comments that we got. Um, <laughs> thanks, Tim. I don't know if I'm a prince. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll go back and forth and answer questions. I answer questions all the time. So uh, that's, that's one of the things, and I guess one of the things I like I, uh, about this this meeting format is it gives me an opportunity to um, help teach you all and, and, and share a little bit about um, what we're doing. Um, it's a, it's a this wildlife management, deer management, it's a complicated business. Um, 
So I, I, I want to try to, and, and that's one been one of my goals, you know, since I started was to try to provide all of you with more information. Um, oh, Brian asked from the French yeah. Frenchman unit still have bonus tags for whitetail antlers. Um, that's something we'll look at um, here in the coming weeks. We'll have discussions with our, our staff um, and look at our antlers harvest um, as well as our, our, our uh, permits in, in, in that unit um, and decide whether or not what we, what we need to do there to, to correct some of that harvest and, and do what we need to do. So, um, hey, Luke. That, that, oh, go ahead. Luke, this would be a good time to mention, I mean, we're kind of getting at the end here, but that our, our deer, um, our big game orders will be oh. out days prior to the April commission meeting. And we post those on the website. And, um, you know, we encourage you to take a look at those. And if you have some comments that you, that you offer those to us or come to our commission meeting um, and, and voice, you know, your, your comments or concerns on, on those as well. But that's coming up here at the April commission meeting. Yeah. And I'll, I can, I can kind of work through our whole process to, um, bore people some more but we right now obviously we've taken a lot of input over the last few weeks from from you know hunters landowners everybody um we, we'll be we're looking at our harvest data um we actually have a, a group of our biologists and administration um that we all meet together um for two and a half days um we've well we've been having weekly meetings having some discussions about um, some of this already, but trying to prep us for the, those days where we go through all of our big game permits, um, you know, which for this meeting is uh, deer, antelope, elk. Um, and so then we'll, we'll run through all of our harvest data, um, decide, you know, what it is that we would like to do. Um, and then it, through a few more discussions, um, you know, internally, we'll, we'll always, you know, refine some of those before we uh, make those um Put those into orders to put them in front of the commission um there uh uh in march and then to to be voted on at the the april meeting um and then they go into effect for the following season so so they should be on our website probably that last weekend or last week of march yep and then the commission meeting itself is april 28th at uh, in niobrara state park yep and i can Here's the, I'll share the, this is the link um, there that goes to our website that's got the, all the, the regulations, all of our orders um, there in how we uh, set those rules. Um, but yeah, late March, early April is when that stuff will all be um, posted. So. Yeah, no, again, um, I thank you all for joining us. Uh, hopefully you found some use in this, gotten some information out of it. Um, but yeah, with that, um, I think we'll probably go ahead and shut it down. So. Thank you, Luke. Hey, thank you. Thanks for joining us.